Joining us now. All right. <coughs> Let's start. Um, today we're going to talk about Stephen Jay Gould. Okay. Um, and so in the syllabus, we highlight two scientists, Darwin and Gould. Gould is no Darwin. He's cool. He did great things. Okay. But he's not Darwin. Okay. So I don't have some sort of false equivalence here. Okay. <coughs> um, but he did do some important things for macroevolution. Okay. That's why I want to highlight him today. Okay. Plus, you know, when I was taking this class, he was my instructor. I was so much luckier than you guys are. Um, <coughs> Right, so, you know, here's Darwin, here's Gould, and actually, it's like that. okay. Um, <coughs> but again, you know, you know, you know, I'm a little pixel here, and most people, you know, are a little pixel, so, you know, keep, keep that in mind. <coughs> so, he seems primarily as an author. So he wrote 26 books. He was a columnist for a magazine, Natural History magazine, okay. Um, but it wasn't like, you know, Ask Amy or some sort of column. I mean, it was about science and about evolution. Um, <coughs> and he also wrote a book that was a synthesis of evolutionary thought as well. Um, and so he stands for basically three things. One is popularization. Okay, so check that. One is punct punctuate equilibrium, which people affectionately call punk eek. And one is for arguments against pan-selectionism. Okay. <coughs> um, so, you know, why am, why am I in biology and doing this? Well, it's because I was given a book by, by Gould as a freshman in high school. I said, oh, but evolution is not testable. It's not real science. I gotta read this book. Um, and so this talks about the Burgess shale organisms and how there are these, you know, different, different origins of different body plans, most of which have died out, some of which persisted. Okay. Um, <coughs> and so that's an example of, you know, what, what the utility of popularization of science can be. Right, you help broaden the pool of people who are involved in it. Okay. Yeah. How did you in high school? Oh, no, no, I knew, that someone gave me his book in high school. I knew, I had his course in college. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. No, freshman in high school was uh, just a regular science teacher gave me a book. I'd later met him as a fresh, yeah, freshman in college. Or so, I mean, a sophomore. Yeah. Probably a sophomore. But he, I mean, I was like one of many. Like, I'm not going to remember most of you in five years. You remember me in five months, I'm sure. <coughs> All right. So here's one of his big ideas. All right, so I'll give you a chance to read through it. So what's he talking about here? Something we covered in class already. So I'll give you a chance to talk to each other about it. So talk to your neighbor. What what this what this means. Yeah. Uh, 
All right. So, what's he saying? So they're not trying to, you know, achieve humans. Like, yay, we have an appendix. We can joke when we eat. Woo! Um, right? Okay. What else? Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. There's not this old like great chain of being idea. We talked about like primitive and derived taxa and how it's a bad way to think about biology. I mean, people are still thinking about that. Saying no, it's not that, it's a tree. Okay, yeah. Uh, the last Mostly, but also he's talking a bit about it being a passive trend, right? So not necessarily. Right, evolving only towards complexity, but you think about the complexity scale, and you start off here, and here is a minimum. Then, through time, some can go this way, but some can go this way. Right. So, <coughs> so that's what it says. You know, there's no trend in the usual trends, so it's not. Um, Something like this, where it's always going this way, we can go leftward or rightward, right? But because we have this boundary, it tends to get gets bigger, right? So, so an asymmetrical expansion and diversity around a starting point constrained to be simple, right? So you have a starting point, you have expansion, increase in variance, okay? You have this boundary, right? So it's like when we're talking about our, our passive trend, right? If I start off, I'm not gonna fall over. If I start off over here, have you all end up along this wall, right? And you jostle, right? Well, some of you are going to be stuck on the wall, some of you are going to go way over here, right? Um, because it's just unlimited expansion area that, this way. And so it's that, that same thing that. So it's just a way of describing a passive trend. Okay. <coughs> um, so that's the main point of that. Okay. Um, Okay, and Gould's also a big um, part of being clear about philosophy of science and what science is. Okay, um, so I'll give you a chance to read this when we talk about this. So you should talk talk about it with each other. I better better been better prepared for class would have had like an apple suspended from like floss or something. <laughs> All 
All right. This is going to be a fifth round of talk. So what's he, what's he talking about here? Other people? We didn't know that it happened. We didn't know. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have these, you know, the facts that we're observing. We observe apples falling. You know, we observe data showing change of apes to become human like. Um, <coughs> but the mechanism is a separate question, which we also think we know a lot about. It's different from the facts. Right? Um, so this is back to sort of the nature of science. Right? So you probably learned the scientific method. Right? Like, what's the scientific method? You're, you're teaching it to your fourth grade nieces, you know, elementary school class. Observe, right? <coughs> From process. Experiment. 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 Where does NS NSF funding go? <laughs> <laughs> what else? Okay. Where where would that occur? Is it an experiment? Apple Falls. Okay. <laughs> it's never right anymore. It's not like hand moves. What else? Where's theory? So I follow this equals theory. Hypothesis becomes the theory. Right? You're going to problem with that? So, <coughs> this is a common. So, generally, we're right with this. Um, the one odd thing is the role of theory. And so, well, those times we'll tell you what what theories do. Theories aren't sort of verified hypotheses, but rather they are these entire exp explanatory things, right? So evolution, you know, evolution by natural selection <coughs> predicts many, many, many things from this you know central idea, and so out of that sort of big theory, we generate a whole ton of hypotheses. And then we can then test these hypotheses and to see if the theory is you know, a good one. What happens if a hypothesis is rejected? Sorry? 
It's not thrown away. No. Right. But you're right. Usually we just tweak it. Right. So, for example, what's what's the central dogma in molecular in molecular biology? Can we run that for that for? Yeah. This, this is a theory about how evolution travels through a cell. Right? Is that true? <laughs> right. So in most cases, it's true. But not all. What's an exception? Retroviruses. Right, so what's, what's a retrovirus? Goes to discos. Hmm? Yep. So, retrovirus, and I'll draw P7. I don't know any other viruses, but I'm going to do retrovirus. Right. <coughs> we'll take its DNA or RNA and stick it into a host genome. And later it can pop back out. Okay. <coughs> um, and so we have, you know, some movement backwards in information flow. Right? Um, so does that mean we throw away central dogma? Then this case is a tweak. So we say, okay, in most cases, because of this flow, but there's another way of getting information back the other way. So you can go from RNA to DNA and then incorporate it, or then just go back to RNAs again. Okay? <coughs> and so with you know, evolution. So Darwin has the idea of natural selection, he didn't have genetics at all, puts genetics in. Right now I think about evolution due to natural selection with genetics, and now learning about epigenetic factors too. As rather than just the DNA being passed on, you sort of tag DNA with methyl groups and can affect expression of genes. <coughs> so even if you have the same identical sequence, you can have different phenotypes depending on how it's tagged. <coughs> Banksy working in your genome. Okay, <coughs> and so it's another way of inheritance. It's not DNA based. It's acting on the DNA. Okay, does that violate natural selection? No, which is a different mechanism. Okay, so <coughs> right. So in general, we will modify theories and tweak them, um, but not infinitely. Someone might come up with a better, different theory, and then it supplants the other one. So what's an example of that we talked about in this class? This is a catchy song associated with it. Yep. Right. So what's what's that theory? Mm -hmm. Right. So the Earth has plates moving around. And animals and plants are riding these plates. And so, you know, I, I'm living in South America. I'm an armadillo. Wait, North America? Oh, cool. I can go to Texas. It's bristle that way. <coughs> what theory did that, that displace? Right, so it's a far simpler theory that like Earth is a rock, doesn't move around. Um, so they did think that there'd occasionally be land bridges. So how do you get something to cross from North America to, uh, you know, Hawaii? Land bridge appears, walk over, like that. right? <coughs> so it has these, you know, things you have to keep adding to the theory. So like epicycles for Copernican theory of planets, planetary motion, right? Um, that makes it a not very simple thing, but it was just the competing theory, and then we find out that plate tectonics does a much better job of predicting, predicting things. Why we have so much similarity between South America and Africa and Australia, because they all used to be you know, right next to each other. Because we see the same thing here. Okay. <coughs> so it's not that 
once you get to a bunch of hypotheses that are shown a lot of times, it becomes a theory. It's a theory of this large thing that predicts many hypotheses and explains why. Why is it just predictions about observations? Okay. <coughs> um, and sometimes you can have a single experiment that will show, you know, a previous theory is wrong. Um, can you think of any examples of that? Okay, anyone remember Newtonian physics versus relativity? Okay. Um, so Einstein's theory predicts that if I have, you know, a light bulb, this is it an innocent light bulb, those haven't seen one. Um, <coughs> if I have a light bulb and it's sending light by some heavy thing, if okay, anything has any mass, it'll be warped. Okay? Massive objects bend light. Okay? You're actually bending light too, but this pen's bending light just not very much. Okay? <coughs> and so, whereas with Newtonian physics, light travels in straight lines. Okay? Once it passes through like a lens, it bends it or something like that. But through, through space, it would go through a straight line. Okay. So there's a case where there was a, um, I think it was Venus going behind the sun, okay. and to an observer on Earth, it's an eye, um, she or he would see it, you know, go behind here, and then later come back up the other side, right? Um, if, so that's if, line, if light travels in a straight line. If Einstein is right, then you should actually see it earlier because the sun would bend the light towards the eye. Okay? <coughs> and so here's a very clear case where you get very different predictions. Now, of course, it could be that you know, it's small enough difference that it's fuzzy and you can't tell it's not significant. Right? So you have to worry about um, precision of estimates, but in this case it was clear enough. You can see that, yep, it appeared sooner than you'd expect under Newtonian physics. So light's bending. So Tony thinks is wrong, Einstein's theory is right. Because it's a nice clear case where a single example can show it. Okay? And biology is not that not so clear. Right? Because biology is a much fuzzier statistical thing. So do things tend to become more adaptive through time? Yes. Are there exceptions? Yes. Right. <coughs> so a single exception doesn't prove it, disprove it in the same way that it does with some physics examples. Okay, because still accumulate lots of lots of evidence for it. Okay. I have questions about this? And so Gould's point here is that evolution is a fact. Mm -hmm. You can, you know, observe it in the lab, um, observe it in nature. Right? So we know evolution happens. Natural selection is a theory to explain why evolution happens. Okay. <coughs> and modern synthesis brings you know, natural selection in with Genetics, paleontology, and other fields, too. Right. So Gould was only a popularizer. He was also a, you know, a evolution biologist in his own right. Okay, so he's both the Neil deGrasse Tyson of his day, right, but also did, did work in, work in um, biology itself. Okay. Um, <coughs> so here's... Um, so this comes from a famous paper in 71, Aldridge and Gould. Okay. Um, so this is sort of the outline of the paper. Let's just get to the meat of it. So paleontology views, according, according to them, paleontology says that um, change happens slowly in a sort of gradual speed. Okay. Um, and so, so this sort of view that we have a change, you know, through time, but we only see jumps because we observe a fossil here and a fossil here, 
with nothing between. Okay, so that's what, what how they characterize a standard view. Okay. <coughs> um, so this, you know, all all the breaks are just from lack of data. And what Gould and Eldridge think is that you have a population going through time, you have an Alpatric event, one population stays as it was, the other one changes rapidly to new conditions and change state. So rather than having this gradual change, you've gone from here to here, but it's through a jump like that. Okay? Um, and thus many breaks are real breaks. This idea came partly from ideas from Ernst Meyer, who was one of the founders of modern synthesis, who thought that um, evolution might work best in small populations. Okay, so big populations, you have these, so he thought of this cannibalization where the, you're resistant to mutation, to genetic change, and so you can have a genetic change, but still have the same phenotype. It makes evolution hard, but if you had a small population, you could escape this. Okay, we don't think that's the, the, a big role anymore, but we do think that Populations you can have things like drift happening more than large populations. Okay. Also, if we think that this happens from dispersal of some new habitat, you could have an adaptation to a new habitat and cross lead to change. Okay. So here's how they, you know, again characterize the way people use the break. Um, or, you know, this sort of model to think is not right. And I think the true model is something like this. So you have existing, and then each event, when they say the same, and they change. Okay, any questions about this? No, this is a, a particular diet, uh, like a, a drawing they did. Yeah. Um. yeah. I mean, I mean, not even done that. It might just be my ruler with pen. <coughs> okay, so one thing you can actually do is test this, right? Um. And so, under Punky's, we sort of see changes happening on the appreciation change happens throughout the tree. And so what you can do is fit different models and see which models best explain the data. Okay. We'll talk more about how you can do this in, the, in, a, few, in a week or two. Okay. And so cladogenetic changes only at branching events and genetic changes throughout the tree. Okay. And you also have models that have mixture. Okay. <coughs> and different kinds of breaks of Interactive aspect of the thing. So, what are the, what's the conclusion from this? <clears throat> so, what does this plot show? So it shows that gluten allergens weren't right about everything, right? So it's not just simple like, oh yes, it's only antigenetic, it's only cladogenic. It's actually a mixture. Of, so sometimes it's like common, but sometimes it's not at all. It's sometimes it's mixed. <coughs> what should be what should you be worried about with this sort of thing? Well, they actually, so they came from these mod, the, like these, these are implementations of this, of these models and software. Yeah. 
just look back to significance. All right, so try and see which models are significantly better from the other, or in this case, it's sort of relative weight for each model. Okay, so how much do they support each model? Okay. Um, and there, the issue is that, so NGENEC is a different model than CloudGenic. Right? It also needs combined models. Have to have a mixture of both of these. Right? So these models are restrictions of more complex models. So if you have very little data, what, what will your data do for a model? You choose a simple one or one? Simple. Simple. Right? So if I have five data points, I can't fit 30 parameters. People try all the time, which annoys me, but, but you can't. There's not enough data out there to do it. <coughs> Even if you have 30, 30 data points and no five parameters, you might not have enough data to actually fit those parameters well. So various ways of fitting models might select a simple model. Or it could just be that, you know, you fall down to, you know, cladogenic or antigenic, you have too much data. You have more data you get to a more complex model. Okay. That still won't explain the frequency of the versus antigenic. Yeah. So, is the y axis, is it Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, it would probably be a little different result. So, yeah. So the question she's asking, so this IKK weight, what does this mean? And <coughs> if we're comparing model fit, so, so people are taking stats with Jim, with Jim Ford, I think that's like that, right? Have you talked about model fit? Yeah. So what's the point of, what's the point of fitting models? The best way to explain data is have one parameter per data point. Mm -hmm. That fit it perfectly. Mm -hmm. Right. So when you're fitting models, it's a mixture of trying to explain the data and also trying to be able to predict future data. Right. So if you have a very specialized model, um, <coughs> you won't be able to um, predict things well. Right. Um, <coughs> so we talked about um, you know ovary size in this classroom. Right. So there's various things that could affect ovary size. One is sex, right? One is body size, and things like that. If I had as many parameters as people in this class, right? When I have a new person say, let me predict ovary size, you know, whether or not they're male or female, <coughs> might not. You know, I, I still have enough. I might still need more parameters to predict what they actually don't know that male or female is a big, a important parameter for that, right? Because <coughs> I've overfit my data. But if I have a more appropriate model and say, oh. But the biggest variation is caused by sex. You have X, XX or XY. Once you have that, then you can, you know, think about body size and smaller fit, things predict better. And so here we're trying to do is fit the best models. Um, this is just a measure of how much information you lose about reality from a model. Okay. And it's very complex in terms of the theory behind it, but the actual implementations easy to use. Okay. And so they're saying that. <coughs> you know, this model for this one loses this amount of data, of information about your data. Um, so that's a lot of weight. Of course, another thing you should worry about is um, the actual parameter estimates, right? So let's say I select this model that has both, right? Those could be, still be primarily in a genetic, tiny bit of cladogenetic change, or it could be mostly cladogenetic. I need to change. Right, so you should look at the parameter estimates too. <coughs> and you can see you know, for these models, the probability of changes at the range. Right? So the model is pretty high, but the model is pretty low. Correlating to whether it's antigenic or platogenic. 
Okay. So here we see sort of model selection being used to tell us about theories of evolution. This is happening gradually, is happening, or is happening episodically. Okay. Questions? A little pensive. A bored to tears. All right, pan-selectionism. Seems to read this. Mm -hmm. oh, we can skip this again. All right, um, let's talk about this. All right, so what are they talking about here? Are they saying natural selection doesn't happen? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Everything's optimized, and also not everything evolved through um, becoming, you know, being selected for that current purpose. So, if you remember the beginning, early we had the dragon lecture, right? And it was a bird that had its wings for, look for, used its wings to hunt fish underwater, right? To give it shade. What, what, what was the jargon we learned for that? Acceptation. Acceptation. Right. People are learning. Um, right, so it's a trait that didn't evolve for the current purpose. I mean, it's sort of co-opted for the current purpose. Okay, and so that term is from Gould, Gould and Verba. Um, <coughs> and so this idea that rather than looking at things and saying, you know, assuming that they're, they're fit for their current usage, so what's a, that's, that should be a hypothesis. And you should test it. Right? So we have this doohickey under our nose, right? these two little ridges. So maybe they're there to you know, direct snot away from your mouth. Right? Or maybe it's just sort of a side effect of how your, how your lips form. Right? So you can't necessarily postulate an adaptive explanation unless you test it. How do you test it? Okay. <coughs> and so you know, T-Rex's forelimb is the same thing. Right. They might have some purpose, but they might have shrunk for no purpose. Basically, not, not be selectory. You know. Okay. <coughs> um, Gould had an example of the appendix, right? So, you know, many animals use their appendix to store bacteria and help with digestion, right? Humans, the appendix periodically kills you. It seems like a very bad trait to have. And so his idea was, 
if it gets bigger, it <coughs> um, just takes more energy, it takes more room, so it's locked against. If it gets too small, it, it the risk of size gets too high. And so it's also this equilibrium between two bad alternatives, right? Where if we do a single jump to having none, it'd be best. Um, recently, we figured out that actually he was wrong about that, and we, what, what, the apex has actually evolved multiple times, and it's thought to help keep your so a re reservoir of good bacteria. And so, if you have a infection that swipe, sweeps through and wipes out your good bacteria and most of your gut, that you can be reinfected by the, the by this re reservoir of good ones later. Something they thought was, you know, maladaptive actually might be adaptive. Okay, but that but really gives a sense of the sort of thinking. Good. Okay. <coughs> um, so here's um, something that comes out of this book, right? So there's a common theme from Gould. Um, so why the tape of life? So I think like if you've ever seen a video cassette tape. Um, And so, <coughs> Piquet was something that was sister to chordates today, okay? And so, you know, and so he's using sloppily as the ancestor of chordates. It wasn't the ancestor, but that's what he's getting right here. He's saying, okay, if, if that individual were wiped out, then we'd have no chordates today. So it's a question about the predictability of evolution. Okay? So Gould's argument argued a lot that evolution was not that predictable. Right, so if you could restart from initial conditions again, um, you get very different outcomes by chance. Okay. In contrast to a view that you know horses are evolving towards you know big crown teeth, and we'd see that again if we could restart again from having you know, short horses, we'd again see this trend. Okay. Um, <coughs> this idea had opponents too. Okay, so I'll let you read an opponent of Gould. Right, so that's opposing view, and here's Gould's response, which of course is longer. <laughs> So the reason is important in evolutionary biology to generate, help generate a lot of debates, you know. Is change gradual or sudden? You know, is life repeatable or not? Right. So what do you think about this debate? Convergence repeat, versus, you know, versus not, not lack of repeatability. I think, which one do you think is correct and also how would you test this?
I'll hit a quick vote. So, those of you who think Conway Morris was more correct, one. I think Google Trucks, two. You, 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 can, you can say either one, it's okay. <laughs> Raise your hands. You must vote. No. There's one life out there. I mean, so I mean, you can think about okay. So, if convergence ex explains more than half the pattern, then go with Conway Morris. If it explains less than half the pattern, we say go with Gould. Right, so there's no, you're not going to be right on the fifty-fifty. All right. So, vote. Which one? That's disappointing. I think most people agree. All right. Um, how would you test it? That's how you test. So most of you think that Gould is right. Okay, fine. How do you test that? So if you take a trait that is like light. Like like fluff, like flight. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Not quite, <laughs> but, but I'm hopeful. <laughs> so as long as you're uh, fixing for a relationship, then comparison show you whether or not it's more like based on the range or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, for example, like flight, right? Okay. So. Birds, pterosaurs, and bats all do something with their four limbs. Yeah. And so maybe it's, you know, converting both their four from the same place. Whereas, you know, insects evolve in a completely different way. Okay, good. How else? So had you had that idea 30 years ago, you'd be super famous now. Because someone did, uh, named Richard Lenski, had the idea where he took bacteria and from a common stock started growing them in parallel in the lab and would periodically freeze them. And so he has a, really a phylogeny where you can go back through time and see how things have changed, take an ancestor, thaw it out, compete it with the current one. Okay. And it can see evolution, and so he's used a like a standard stock solution to grow the bacteria in. It had citrate that bacteria can't, the E. coli, so I think it was E. coli, can cannot use as a as a food source, and someone actually evolved the ability to use it as a food source, and it happened different times in different different lineages. So his case of convergent evolution that he wasn't expecting has happened. Um, they can use this new food source, and if you go back and see, um, did they evolve this ability the same way, or were it different paths? And also, we went back, you know, several generations earlier to see, you know, other sort of pre precursors to evolving this ability, and there were. So in that case, if you have enough changes, you can then convergently evolve this. But given enough time, it evolves separately. So exactly, that'd be the way to do it. Good. So 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 I mean, it's more to note that he's seeing those these crazy ideas about like, you know, evolution of life. We can't go back and wipe out bird shell organisms. There's still ways to test these. Good. All right, I'll see you on Friday.